say you are what you eat, so I don't eat chicken feet. But I love me some of Grandma's pickled beets. Well, cut it up, put it in the pan, throw it over your shoulder and see where it lands right here in the farmer's kitchen. Maters, taters, beans and corn, the cows in the barn and the sheep's been shorn, kids in the barnyard chasing Grandpa's chicken. Chicken, chicken. Spices, slices, cuts and dices, gonna slash your grocery prices right here in the farmer's kitchen. Help you grow your garden good with recipes to suit your mood. Try some grub you've never tried before. Smash it with a wooden mallet, gonna educate your palate. Right here in the farmer's kitchen, in town farmer's country kitchen. cook something good now. Funding for Tim Farmer's Country Kitchen brought to you by Woods Equipment Company has every tool you need to make working the land as rewarding as hunting. L81 Bottling Company. Taste, love, and share the tradition. Rose Farm Supply, family farming and commitment to our customers since 1982. House Warmings, meeting all of your outdoor living and fireplace needs. Hello and welcome to Tim Farmer's Country Kitchen and Nikki Farmer's Country Kitchen. Oh, thank you. Look around you, Nikki. You know what? Our original intent was for Tim Farmer's Country Kitchen television show to be in a very traditional setting. Well, by golly, we've got it now, thanks to Harvest Cabin. We're gonna visit with the guys up there in Michigan, and we're gonna talk about how these things are made. You pick a spot, they drop it off. It's absolutely fabulous. We took a trip to Good Foods. I love that store. Absolutely. We got us a bunch of wonderful ingredients, including goat cheese, uh, some chard, some kale, some parsley, potatoes. Organic potatoes. These are our eggs. This is JD Country Milk right here. And this is some cream. It's good cream. It's thick. Too. We can make butter out of that. And if you haven't seen our making butter segment, go back and look on YouTube and uh, check out how to make butter out of cream. That being said, the other day, you said, I'm going to make you something. Mm -hmm. I really like this dish. And what's different about it, usually you boil your vegetables, you don't in this. You said you liked it. It was kind of crispier. Exactly. Yeah, you like it. You know, it. a lot of times when you cook your kale and, and, and you get it really soft, right. this was not like that. It still had some of the texture mm -hmm. like, like you hadn't cooked it that long. Right. So if you like kale and chard and greens, you're more than likely going to kind of like this. And if you don't like them, you probably still like it because it's that good. It is good. So what do you do? How do you start are this you going to help me? I'm going to help you. All right. I'm going to cut up half an onion, and I want you to go ahead you and... you want me to saute the You're going to saute for me, yeah, yes. I don't have any problem with that. I like All right, onions. It's almost a half an onion then. I'm going to go ahead and butter this up a little. Or you could use oil. Yeah. Whatever you want to use in that. I'm going to take these organic potatoes. Okay. You could use the Yukon yellow, but I like reds. You know, mm -hmm. we like reds. And we're going to slice them very thin. This is going to be our pie, sh like our shell, like our right. crust. I'll tell you what, I really like this. And it wasn't anything really strong taste-wise, but just the combination of ingredients. Now, how long are you cooking this? You say about 45 minutes? 45 minutes at yep, 3. 350. Mm -hmm. Do you have my oven going? I do. All right. So you don't have to get real fancy smancy here, but you're just basically outlying the bottom and the, and the side area. All right. You know what? Go ahead and get that laid out. And let's go visit with one of our favorite gardeners. Bobby Joe Ellis has been gardening for a long time. And let me tell you what. Sometimes the simplest little hints can help you go a long way, and Bobby is always good for some of that. Let's go visit him right now around Perryville, Kentucky in his secret hideaway garden. We're back. Oh, okay. It's garden time with, right. with world famous gardener and multi billionaire. Yeah, you got Bobby that. Jones. <laughs> got that all wrong. <laughs> you know what? We're in the land of the Purple Martins. Yeah. You got them up here. Yeah, we've got, got a few of them. This is the time of year. We talked about them last year. We did, we did, they're already gone by this point, but they're back. Uh -huh. And now we're looking at your garden, and I'm so jealous. I'm almost mad at you. So many people try so many different things to get 
you know, enclosures or things for them to grow on. Your tomatoes are structured with concrete wire. Right. Now you can go buy a, a bale or a roll of concrete wire for about, what, 120 bucks? About 100, 120 dollars. And you put hog clips on them. Right. To make it the size you want. Right. Now the ones you get at the store, they're kind of shaped like a V. They get the plant hung up in it. And, and, they, and you get a little wind and it lays down. It lays on. down. You only got three legs going in the dirt. And they break right. and they bust. So you just take a pole in there Right. Let them do their thing. You give them plenty of room to climb up there. And it keeps your fruit up off of the dirt and mud all, all yeah. year. Now, when it comes to your beans, you've got cattle panels up. Right. And then on top of that, you have taken you some tobacco sticks. Tobacco sticks. Those cost $8,000 a piece, right? <laughs> Not now. <laughs> <laughs> and you've got them kind of in there, and you've got like the third panel down to, to kind of create that. And that way, when you, when you prize it over, you don't have to tie it one place. And a lot of people put wire on it, but I've just put those little zip ties. Zip ties and clip them off. All right, let's talk about the fact that uh, you've already got tomatoes. Got tomatoes. Now I'm really mad at you. Yeah. <laughs> now you carted them in and out of the. Yeah, uh, they, right. they've been here quite a while. I've uh, had them in a wagon in the, in the, the night and out in the daytime. So they're spoiled. Yeah, right. you've spoiled them. Now let's talk about what kind of cabbage you like to grow. A stonehead. Stonehead. It, stonehead. It's not a real big. Head of cabbage, but it's real, real solid. Real solid. And early. It's early head of cabbage. You like that early stuff? Oh, uh, yeah, I do. And you, then you get Lois busy making your. Making the kraut. Making the kraut. <laughs> yeah. We all love the kraut. We'll probably make the kraut out of the fall cabbage. The fall cabbage? Yeah. What time do you put your fall cabbage in? Uh, it'll be in July. In July? Yeah. So it's not too late for anything. You no, still, right. You still even, put your corn out? Your, yeah, the corn is now coming up, so it's, it's still plenty of time. So not too late. According to your farmer's almanac, how did that help you in, in this well this season? You know, that's uh, that's been passed down generation to generation and it's something we've always done. And like the beans, we could have planted those a week ago, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday. And I waited till Monday to plant them. Yeah. And the signs moved out of the head and heart. And yeah. When they move in the lower part of the body, you don't plant any of your beans or any ground crop. Yeah. That's a very complicated process, but hey, look, I've seen your it's gardens, working. and everything you've done is like magic here. So what else, what other tips do you have that might seem obvious to some? Broccoli, I don't usually put out in spring. Ordinarily, it's real warm, but now, and I have a trouble keeping worms off of it. So I put the broccoli out in the fall, but I just tried this little dab this time. It looks like it did yeah. well for you. Yeah. How long have you yeah. had it out? Middle of March, I'd say. Middle of March? Uh -huh. And it's ready yeah. to harvest. Yeah. Yeah, it's ready to go. Now let's talk about what kind of pole beans you have. Fortex. How do you spell that? F-O-R-T-E-X. Vortex. Now you're talking about these these cats are some some yeah, long humdingers. Beans, right. And they taste good though. Yeah, they do. They're the best bean we've ever run across. Where do you get your bean, where do you get your seeds from? I order them. From Burpees. Burpees. You yeah. get the catalog? <laughs> yeah, I got You sit around and look at the catalog yeah. in the spring. <laughs> and then you order your stuff out of there. Uh, right. Yeah. You wait for the mail. Right. Like a little kid waiting for Christmas. Like Christmas. <laughs> and the beans, they when they're advertised, they say they're best to pick from nine to eleven inches. Gotcha. But a lot of these last year got up to 15 inches, and there's not a sign of a string on the beans at all. You just break the two ends off and break them up and can them. You said 15 inches. 15 inches. I That's had a lot of 15 inch beans. Unreal. And they yeah. taste good. Yeah, they do. They're real good. All right, so today's lesson is most of us like to put out a garden, and we like, we like to think about how things are going to come up. Cattle panels, tobacco sticks, concrete wire is the way to go, and you'll be it, on your way to a... And it's, it's say if you do this, then uh, like your stick bean, you do it with sticks, mm -hmm. and in about two years, you got to redo it. Yeah. And this lasts for 10 years. Bobby Joe, we'll be back shortly. Okay. We've got some more secrets from you. I know you're, I know you're hiding something from us. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> Do you see my cute little crust? I see your cute Do you little like crust. That? We're just going to salt, salt pepper that. Now we're going to take your onions. <laughs> and I want to take this uh, chance right now to thank all the people who have been mailing us and messaging us on Facebook. Let me read you her letter real quick while you're doing that. Don't hesitate to write us and tell us about what's going on. It says, Tim, I'm an avid fan of your show. I love it so much that it's become a routine for my husband and I sit on every Saturday morning and watch your videos on YouTube. After watching your Smokehouse episode, Last Christmas, we built a smokehouse. It's a, that's our pride and joy. I've been making Jay's bacon recipe, and that's the talk between friends, family, and neighbors. Really? 
and they do chickens. They have the smokehouse. She's following our show. They're doing our recipes. We love to hear things like that. Meanwhile, let's get back to our our cooking. Our cooking. All right. Now we're gonna go with the vegetables. So mm -hmm. we got this charred, we got this at Good Foods today. I think these are the neatest little leaves. Absolutely. Don't you like that? You know, you said you were talking to an old lady. Once she tell you about greens? She did. She, I didn't even know what these were, and she just said these are wonderful. They're sweet, and anytime you have greens, you should add a little bit. I said cut it off about down here. You don't want too much of the. She said you can have some of the red, but she mm -hmm. said cut it off a couple inches down. So we only need vitamins and minerals. Yes. We're going to use maybe two of these because we only need about a cup and a half. All right. I'm going to roll these up like a little cigar and just cut little. So this is what you were so busy doing in there the other yeah, day. Yeah, just cutting this up. Just like the folks in the Tampa Bay area and all over the United States and around the world are watching us on YouTube. Check us out on TimFarmersCountryKitchen.com. Check out recipes you might not have seen before. Check out some recipes. We got plenty of them. Well, now we're going to take some kale. All right. And we're going to maybe use about three pieces. And we're just going to tear that off. So it's probably, a, I bet, a cup and a half of chard if you wanted to actually measure it. And maybe a cup of kale. Because we're actually going to pour this in the pie. And now just a little bit of parsley, too. So I'm going to cut it. Maybe I'd say a quarter cup. And then if you want to get some of that thyme, we want to put... We'll put a little thyme in there? Yeah, about a, about a teaspoon And we put it in, in with this? Put it in the greens. In Everything's the greens. in the gotcha. greens. And I did, I did taste that thyme in there when you were, when you were cooking it. Did you? It, just it a stood out bit. nicely. It's birdie. Just mix it up. And we're going to take it. It says kind of bunch it together. Mm -hmm. We're going to smush it in here. That's that part. Now we're going to take eight of our chicken eggs. Gotcha. Takes a lot of eggs. So you, you just kind of whip these up and then pour them over? And we're going to put a little bit of cream in there also, about a quarter cup. We took a trip today to get all our stuff at Good Foods. And while we were there, I've always wanted to see somebody make mozzarella cheese. You know, it's not that hard to make. That's what I heard. Well, and guess what? We found a fellow over there who was just making a batch up. And here's Jeremy to show us how you make fresh mozzarella cheese, which we brought some home. And we're going to fix up a snack in just a minute with that. Jeremy, you have an interesting job. I do. <laughs> You're making cheese today. I don't know why, but when I was a kid, I was fascinated about people making cheese. And it, to me, it's an interesting process. It's, it's complicated, but not that complicated. Yeah. It's something that you can do right here in a short amount of time. Today, you're making mozzarella. Explain this. What is the whey and the curds? Explain all that if you Definitely. want. Definitely. So what they do is they take cow's milk and they culture it with uh, bacteria, thermophilic bacteria. Basically, that gives it the mozzarella flavor, and that's what makes it mozzarella. Um, but you're not done. All you have right now is liquid with microorganisms in it. So you take a, a substance called rennet, and that's an mm -hmm. enzyme, and you, you put it into the mozzarella, um, and that basically curdles it, and it brings out curd and whey. And now the curd is what you see here, the major portion of it. It's the, um, it's the solid portion of the mozzarella curd. Whereas the whey is all the liquid down here. Mm -hmm. um, and the whey is actually what you use to make more mozzarella. You can throw uh -huh. that into a batch of milk. But yeah, so that's the mozzarella curd that we're dealing with today. Now take a look here at this segment we did a while back. We used your mozzarella to make our pizza on the big green egg. It was absolutely scrumptious. But I am gonna ask you to step us through that right here. You take your curd mm -hmm. that you get in this fashion and what do you do with it? Step us through it. Basically, you take the big mozzarella curd, uh, you, get a, you get a reasonable amount. We take about 10 pounds, uh, and then we cube that up into about half-inch cubes. And then what we do is we just pour hot water over it. You want hot water. Um, you don't want it to be boiling, but you also don't want it to be too cool. So about 165 to 185 degrees uh, is perfect, just to melt it down, just to get it pliable enough to make it into uh, mozzarella shapes. This is about two quarts. I'm just gonna kind of heat it up for right now because it is a little cold still. Uh, and it is, the water is uh, pretty hot, so I usually use about two or three pairs of gloves just so I don't burn myself. I heated it up to room temperature and I'm gonna go a little past that and uh, dump it out and add more so I can actually melt it down. We salt it really well, season it, make sure it's perfect. You wanna use about a tablespoon for every pound of mozzarella that's in this bowl. So we have 10 pounds, so we'll use about 10 tablespoons. It's just now starting to uh, melt down. So basically, you'll know when it's ready is if when you, when you start to pull it, it doesn't break apart, but rather it stretches, I mean, on and on. And then you know it's in perfect condition to start forming it into mozzarella balls. Uh, and then we take that, we ball it up, wrap it up, and throw it in some ice. Let it just uh, form up into those mozzarella balls that you see in our store here. All right, they're chilling. 
They are. Like a villain. <laughs> and what's the next step here? Well, we'll take one out. You kind of just feel. They're firm enough to hold their shape in the case there, so we just dry them off. Put a sticker on them. Make them ours, and then... Weigh them up? Yeah. I want to thank you very much for taking time out for us today, Definitely. making us some cheese. Yeah. Thank you, Jeremy. <laughs> All right, we held off to watch Jeremy make his mozzarella cheese. That's about a quarter cup, I just do that. Quarter cup of cream. Let's get her all mixed up, so all the same color. What do you think? Looks right. good to me. Now we're just gonna pour this. Just like that. Mm -hmm. We're gonna smush it down, kind of push smush it in it. Nice I like to smush. smush. It's S-M-U-U-U-S-S-S-H-H. -S -S you know, it looks a little peculiar there. I like I'm telling good. you what, once you get all this together. Looks pretty. And it's good for you. Yeah. I mean, really, we only use probably a tablespoon of butter. I'm gonna use my hands. And just pinch off some goat cheese all around it. So that's what you did. You just kind of pulled it on stuff. Mm -hmm. And that's going to kind of melt into it a little bit on the top. And that's it. You want to open? You want uh, here? I'll open it, and you put it in. Alrighty. Ready? There you go. Last week, the edible plant show. Love that. Interesting stuff. Just to walk around and grab stuff off the ground. Red buds it. are good. Wood sorrel. Now. On the same vein, her husband, who's an outdoorsman, he wanders around out in the woods all the time and goes way down in the gorge. And there are things that you can take with you when you're out and about in the mm -hmm. woods, way out in the middle of nowhere, that may just save your life. Craig Cottle, tell us about how you got into this interesting world of um, survival and, and being out in the woods and, and learning how to fend for yourself if things got bad. Now, as we know, uh, there's a lot of national parks, there's a lot of wide open spaces, even in Kentucky, where you can go and walk for days and Danny Boone Forest and things like that. Right. There are times when you might get stuck in a situation and in that type of situation, what would you want to have with you? What, what's the basic things that you would want to have at any given time to assure that you could pull yourself out of a sticky Well, the situation? way we try to approach any type of survival situation is from a mindset, tactics and techniques, and then gear. And so if you have proper mindset, history has proven, you, you can have zero gear. If you've got your mindset right, then you can survive a lot of situations. Now what gear does for us is it provides an opportunity to make things easier for us. Because the gear there is what's going to make it a whole lot easier for us to find uh, the shelter, the fire, water, and the food. You mentioned three things. Or the, the, the number three, how is that essential in survival? Well, I wish I had copyrighted this, but this, was, this is made up by the United States military, and that's what they refer to as the rule of threes, which says, and this is a generalization, not, these are not absolute numbers. You can't live more than three hours without maintaining your core body temperature. You can't live more than three days without water, and you can't live more than three weeks without food. And the reason they teach it that way is so that you know in any given survival situation, because you're going to be stressed, that any given uh, survival situation, you know what your priorities are. In, in essence, the first thing you gotta do is maintain your core body temp. Then you can start looking for water, and then you can start looking for food. So, you know, I brought a, a bunch of stuff, and I'm gonna look at it from two different perspectives. I'm gonna look at it from the pioneer, frontiersman type mm -hmm. perspective, like a Daniel Boone or Simon Kenton or some of that nature, and then some of the modern tools that'll help us well, out. Show us that. I like the old bag. It's just me. All right, so what we have right here is basically a possible's bag. My dad made me this. Uh, my dad makes these sort of things, and, and so uh, he, I make stuff for him, and he makes stuff for me, and we trade. There you go. So here's what, here's what your Daniel Boone is gonna carry with you first. He's gonna have some sort of knife, a tool that he can utilize that he's gonna be able to do a lot of function with. I call that a small cutting tool, and then he'll have a large cutting tool, whether this is tomahawk or a bag ax or something of that nature. What he also carried with him was a, was a fire starting kit. Mm -hmm. And he can make his char cloth inside of this, and he would also have inside of it, oftentimes, a lens that he could utilize to start a fire, as well as he'd have tender material. Right. This is just cedar bark. And then he would also have and steel. And so this is what he would use to start a fire. So it's real simple. I, I call most of these things sparky devices because yeah. it's going to cause sparks. And basically what's happening here is you have a piece of carbon steel and a piece of flint. The flint is actually a harder surface than the steel. And so when I strike the flint, the steel against the flint, basically what's happening here is molten pieces of steel are coming off of this striker. And basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to catch one of those 
on a piece of char cloth. Now I had to have this beforehand. This is not something you're going to find in the woods. Right. This is a piece of organic material, whether it's plant or fabric material that's organic. Cotton is a good choice. And I hit it in such a way, what we're hoping to do is catch a spark like that right there. Yeah. So when that spark hits the char cloth, what I'll then do is take the char cloth, put it into some tender material like the cedar bark or maybe some uh, other wood material and then I'll blow that into a flame. If you had a candle and you could get it lit, then you can utilize it to start a fire because it makes right. that's basically the frontiersman's lighter. Now nowadays we got lighters. We got the lighter. Good thing to have that's what we're gonna have, absolutely. Show me the show me the newer bag here. Alright, so what we have in the newer bag, well first and foremost from my perspective, what we're gonna do is we're always gonna carry a lighter with us. This go. has got to be in your pocket. This has got to be on your body at all times. Because if you lose your bag, if you lose what is in your pack or something, you've already got your fire starting material. Again, it's high priority, and so we want to have this on our body. It's, it's the whole thing of preparedness uh, rather than paranoia. That's the way I like to take a look at it, is that if you're going to go on any trip, one of the main things that you can do anytime you go outside is tell people where you're going and what time you expect to return. What happens if you're in an area where you don't have clean water? Now, when I was a kid, I got lost in the woods, and the first little puddle of water I saw that was coming out of the side of the hill, I thought, boy, that looks good and cold. Right. I, I was sick for two weeks. I don't know if it was Jardia or what. I thought I was going to die. Right. It's bad. How can you keep that from happening? A couple things to consider. One is if you're starting to sense that you have the signs of dehydration, like your skin stands up on your hand, you have that strong desire of thirst in your mouth, you're urinating and it's dark, or you're not urinating at all then you still need to take the risk and drink dirty water. And right. I say that because if you get dehydrated and you start getting uh, dehydration cramps, you're done. You're mm -hmm. going to be done for. You're not going to be able to walk. You're not going to be able to crawl. Mm -hmm. And so drink the dirty water. Now, what I have in my kit that can assist me in this situation is there's all kinds of apparatuses that you can utilize to cleanse water. Now, what this one is, is a Sawyer water filter. This is the one that I feel, this is new, uh, new to me at least. Uh, I've done a ton of research and study on these. I think this is the way to go. The reason I say that is because this little filter right here is good for 100,000 gallons of water. Wow. And you can carry it in your pocket. Now, the way this little guy is designed is it comes with these bags and you can screw, like you can put dirty water into this bag. Wow. And then you can screw that onto the filter and you can drink through it just like just a like straw. Just like a straw. Um, would you come back and share some tips with us here or there? Absolutely. And kind of show people what, what you can do out there to maintain your livelihood and so you can come back home and see yeah, your wife. I would love to do that. Because I think my wife kind of likes me. All right. Then we'll get her back. We'll back. get you back to her then. <laughs> hey, how do we yeah. get a hold of you, man? You can contact me at uh, our website, naturereliance.org. Right. You can send us an email at info at naturereliance.org. And we have a real active Facebook page under the same name. We got a YouTube channel under the same name. And you give classes. Oh, we do classes all the time. All the time. We have an online set of classes as well. We're People all over the world literally are training with us, and I'm filming stuff right here in Kentucky. It's it's pretty awesome. Wonderful. Yeah. I like the sound of that, and your wife can show us what to pull out of the trees and eat. That's the way. Off the grass. We're a team. We're a good team. <laughs> thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Glad to be here. Well, last and final thing, we need an appetizer. Mm -hmm. So let's go ahead and make a caprice salad. Now, I've seen these on some fancy smancy menus, and sometimes pay fifteen or twenty dollars for this traditional Italian recipe. Where basically it mimics the colors of the flag okay. of Italy. Oh, really? How about that? I didn't know that. And there, there are variations, but just basically a piece of mozzarella cheese. Nobody's going to be as fresh as ours because we've got this today. Tomato, fresh tomato from Kentucky, and basil off of our back porch with just a little bit of balsamic vinegar and maybe a little olive oil sprinkled over top of that, a little bit of salt. That sounds good. And guess what? We're ready to roll. Let's see what you can okay. do with it. Get a fork. Fork. Let's go ahead and set something out here to cool as a backdrop to okay. that. All looks perfect. Nice. This Not could be a idea. snack. This could be a side. This could be a whole meal. Here's your little salad. Good time to tell you about our Facebook page. Check it out, Tim Farmer's Country Kitchen Facebook page. Like it. We got a lot of people out there that we're talking to. Feel free to jump on, talk with us. All right, cut us some of this up. I got to try All some right. of that. I'm gonna reach right up here. Bite. 
Yep, because I'm nice like that. Okay. Mm. Isn't it good? Mm -hmm. Quick and easy snack, mozzarella, tomato. Ready to try the pie? I'm ready to try the pie. Doesn't it look pretty? That does look pretty. And our, the consistency is so cool. We've let it, we've let it cool down. What do you think? Goat cheese is good in it. I it? like that a lot. Green eggs, no ham. I like that. Green eggs, no ham. Green eggs, no ham. And remember, it's all about good times. Good friends. And good eats right here on Tim Farmer's Country Kitchen. See you next week. To order a cookbook or DVD of the show, please call 502-319-0487 or email timfarmerck at gmail.com. Chrisman Mill Vineyards. Good Foods Co-op. Kinco Farm Fence Supplies, Kentucky Beer Cheese, Polecat Custom Smokers, Tater Knob Pottery and Farm, Weisenberger Mill, and Tim Farmer Productions. Funding for Tim Farmer's Country Kitchen brought to you by Kentucky Sheep and Goat Development Office. Try something different tonight. Salt Rocks, the flavor of life. Harvest Energy Solutions, Harvest Cabins, when you absolutely have to get away.